the Tesla Junior Diode. Um, they mentor students, design building spaces solutions that advance equity inclusion across the country, innovative use of construction methods and technologies, partners, board members, higher education practice leaders, and even our own adjunct faculty. And part of the reason why this is so impressive to me is a little known secret is I was an architecture major when I started at UC Berkeley. Wow. Um, all of my faculty were male. Most of the students in the program were male. And I was the only African-American female in the program. Right. And felt like I did not belong in that and decided instead to major in sociology. And so when I saw the flyer, it was a little bittersweet because I thought, wow, what might have been if I had had this experience. But then I also thought how phenomenal that I'm the president of a college that's doing this. So it all worked out in the end. Um, but this kaleidoscope of talent and experience and diversity um, is something unique. And I hope we get to continue to do this because it may be a model for something that needs to be done, not only here in, in our community, but across the country. So I am impressed with the thought that went behind this, the intent, the purposefulness, and I'm pleased to be able to give this as a gift to you all that are joining us here tonight. So thank you for creating this space, Mark. Yes, thank you so much, Dr. Temps. Um, and once, uh, once again, kudos to Mark, who really masterminded this um, and did a lot of the work to get uh, to get this conference up and running. So thanks, Mark. My pleasure. Um, so what I would like to do is to give you just a little brief introduction to each of the panelists. I'll introduce everybody, and then uh, we will see each of the panelists showing us a little bit of their work. So I'll start int by introducing Adese Kade, who is a principal, a member of HO. OK's Global Design Board. Adese has 16 years of experience working in all phases of the profession. Uh, she's worked on innovative projects throughout the West Coast. And before moving to Los Angeles, Adese worked in San Francisco and in Dallas. She is active in the National Organization of Minority Architects, and she enjoys mentoring architecture and interior design students. Adese. Jenny Delgado, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, Adese is also um, a member of the American Institute of Architects, the National Organization of Minority Architects. She has an NCARB certification, which is a national certification for uh, registered architects. Um, and she is also a lead um, by a BD and C certified professional. So leadership in energy and environmental design which means Adese is accomplished. She studied a lot. She's um, done uh, many, many things to do uh, to get these certifications. So um, credits to you for those efforts, Adese. Okay, Jenny Delgado is also a member of the American Institute of Architects and is a leadership in energy and environmental design um, professional. She is an education practice leader at Canon Design. Um, she partners with colleges and universities to design spaces and strategies that address campus challenges and strengthen opportunities for learning and advancement. Jenny has built an indelible passion for designing buildings, spaces, and solutions that advance equity and inclusion across the country as Dr. Thames noted. Don Dyer is a professional landscape architect, an associate, um, ASLA, associate, no, associate? American Society. American oh, Society, <laughs> thank you so much. Oops, sorry. Society of Landscape Architects member and also a leadership in energy and environmental design professional. Don is an associated, um, associate principal at Studio MLA. Um, she is committed to delivering projects with exceptional design, innovative use of construction methods and technologies, and is trained as both an architect and a landscape architect. Don weaves these two disciplines together, creating experiential and sensory 
rich spaces. Um, Kim Patton. Kim, I don't know if you have a lot of letters after your name or not. <laughs> Do you? AIA. Yeah, <laughs> you can leave it in the AIA. That's fine. <laughs> yes, that's a wonderful association to be a member of. And Kim is from the Steinberg Hart Partners uh, partner firm. Um, she's a board member and higher education practice leader at Steinberg Hart. Kim has a passion for higher education planning and design. She has worked with ac academic institutions across the country um, and she um, helps clients navigate complex problems with uh, strategic research, skillful design and planning solutions and all in the uh, effort to achieve direction and clarity in her projects. So with that said, just a quick word about me. Uh, most of you who are attending know that I'm an adjunct member at um, El Camino College and have done that for about 15 years, but I have about 30 years uh, in the profession. Um, and I have specialized in school design. I started with uh, kindergarten and preschool and ended up um, moving all the way up through high school and did a few um, college uh, projects. Well, most recently, right before the pandemic. Um, so basically my work has focused on teaching as we've all been um, a little bit slowed down by the pandemic. Um, and I am proud to say that I'm the third member of my family to have a career in the built environment in Los Angeles. So on that note, I'd like to turn it over to Adeze, and if you would share some of your projects, that would be great. Sure. All right, let me get this queued up. All right. Let's see if I can move this guy. Okay. Of course, the share screen button is right on top of my presentation button. Okay, all right. So can you guys all see my screen? Okay. Yes, we can. All right, well, first, I'm gonna start with just telling you a little bit about me. So I am from Sacramento, California. I'm a twin. I have two younger brothers who are amazing and fantastic. My father is from Haiti. Um, from a very young age, I was obsessed with making and creating spaces and loved playing with Legos. And my mom saw that and wanted to get me involved in architecture and got me books about it. And at nine years old, I decided this is what I want to do. Um, my mom is my biggest mentor. She is a powerhouse in her own right. She shattered many a glass ceiling. She's been um, a VP, a CEO, um, an advocate, an activist. And um, she really helped help shepherd me through the professional design space. And one of my other biggest mentors is Beyonce because she's Beyonce. Um, she's amazing. She's always thinking about what she can do to top herself with her next best biggest thing. And I take that same approach to how I design and think about architecture. architecture. Um, so the grind. So I went to Philadelphia University. After my third year, I transferred to Prairie View A&M University, where I finished my undergrad and got my master's, graduating summa cum laude, and started working at um, HKS in the Dallas office. And I went from Dallas to San Francisco to Los Angeles. I worked my way up from Forum, which is a nine a non-titled professional to principal and shattering glass ceilings and the role model that my mom set. Um, I became the first female design director in the architecture group within HKS and also became the first black female principal in their 80 year history. After that, in 2021, I got the great opportunity to come over to HOK and become the design principal, one of the four leaders running the LA practice. I'm a board member there. 75% um, of the leadership is female. That's one of the things that attracted me to HOK in our Los Angeles practice. And along with my partner, who's featured there in the lower left, um, Ann Fletcher, we both were named um, 2022 Los Angeles Business Journal Women of Influence in Construction, Architecture, and Engineering. Um, some of the alphabet soup that was discussed earlier by Peggy at the bottom there. Um, it's really important to me to become a licensed architect, to be a part of these organizations, and I think it's helped catapult me throughout my career. 
Next, I'll talk about my design philosophy, which is pretty simple and straightforward. I believe that design plus empathy equals extraordinary spaces. And so what does that actually look like? How do you infuse empathy into design? And it starts with this responsible design approach to architecture, thinking about the stakeholders that are involved in the project from the client to the user who may or may not be the same person to the um, community, the co-creators, which includes the architects, contractors, and engineers, and also the community and the environment. Um, through that process, thinking about those stakeholders, um, starting with the idea of having a visioning session with the client, setting those guiding principles of the design that kind of feed into the overall purpose of the project, and then tying that in with the nature of place, understanding where we're building these buildings and how they're affecting the communities that surround them. Next, we're going to go into the work, the fun, pretty pictures. Um, so this is a project that I did up in San Francisco. It's the Jasper. It's a um, multi-family building. It's 39 stories. It's approximately it's um, 320 units, and it's located right at the base of the Bay Bridge. So it has awesome views, very exciting, and it's LEED certified. Here's a view of the exterior design. We incorporated some biophilia with the green wall here. Um, you can see a view of the indoor outdoor pool space and the center image is of the lobby and one of the units. The next project is 50 UN Plaza. This was a building for the GSA. It's a historical renovation and seismic retrofit. And um, it had been uh, vacant for a while before we took over the project to do this um, reinvigoration of the space. And it was completed in 2013. It is a LEED Platinum building, which is the highest level of certification within the LEED program. You can see that there are TV panels on the roof. We reinvigorated and redesigned the courtyard, um, working with um, Clifford Studios, which was very exciting. And when we were working on this project, we did a thing called an eco charrette where we got all the stakeholders around the table um, as far as the client and the co-creators and talked about how the project could have these synergies built into it. So when we're doing the seismic retrofit, we looked at building in these shear walls, which you see in the upper left, and also not only using them for the shear and the seismic retrofit, but also using them as ways to provide passive cooling for the building, which you're seeing in this lower image here on the left-hand side, and also looked at ways to maintain the natural ventilation of the historic building and bringing in daylight into the space by opening up the corridors, which you see in the lower right. The next project is the Bellevue Hotel and Residences. This is in Bellevue, Washington. It's a 245 key um, hotel. And when we say keys in the hospitality space, that's individual rooms because sometimes you have suites that have multiple bedrooms. So we all call them all keys. Um, and then 235 231 units above it. So the lower area here, this gray portion is the hotel and then levels 14 and above are the residences with this featured amenity space up on the top. Um, the top two images are of the hotel. So we took inspiration from the community. It's surrounded by lakes. And so we have this idea and concept of it being a lake house. So you're kind of seeing on the left-hand side, the featured stair in the main lobby that's kind of reminiscent of a deconstructed pier. And then you're seeing elements of that lake house in the lounge space on the right. The lower two images are of the, um, on the left-hand side, that's the main residential lobby, which has a lot more in contrast, a lot more warm woods and tones to it to make Make it feel warm and inviting and very homely. Um, and then the image on the left hand side is from one of the units as well. So you get great views, which is very exciting. This project is located um, in West Hollywood. It's the West Hollywood Edition Hotel and Residences. It's a 190 key hotel with 20 guest rooms on top. And it was designed in conjunction, in conjunction with John Pawson Architects. Here's a finish on the left-hand side, finished image of the lobby space. On the right-hand side on the top is a guest room view, which you get nice views up to the Hollywood Hills. The middle, um, the view picture right below that is of the um, condo space, which provides an indoor outdoor lifestyle, which is great in the Southern California climate. Um, the image below that is of the Ardnar, that's the main restaurant on the ground floor. We, and we mixed in elements of biophilia into the space. And then thinking about community needs, the lower image of the the, um, actually, it's the ballroom, um, and we designed it to have um, movable panels and telescoping seats so that can also be converted into a screening room so it becomes another revenue, a revenue stream for the owner, as well as serving the community because it's LA, there's lots of screenings that happen there, um, and so um, that's another asset to the property. 
The next project is the Gaylor Specific Hotel. It's a 1.7 million, so on the big side, um, um, hotel and convention center located in Chula Vista, which is just south of um, San Diego. It's a hundred and, I'm sorry, 1600 key hotels, so very big. Um, and um, that's expected to be completed in 2023. 20, uh, and I was the designer on this project. And one of the nice things about the Gaylord brand is that every hotel is really rooted in the locale. And so we wanted it to, to be light, airy, have a strong Southern California feel. They have these big atrium spaces that are a landmark with the brand. And we wanted it to feel like an indoor outdoor space. We brought in and worked with the landscape um, architect to bring in a lot of greenery and plants into this space. Next is Robertson Lane Hotel. This is also in West Hollywood. This is a hundred key hotel um, with a massive um, 10,000 square foot ballroom. And it also has a lots of retail space on the ground floor and seeking lead gold. Um, one of the unique things about this project and tying into the community is that there was an historical building called the Factory, which was a very prominent club in West Hollywood and very important to the LGBTQ community. And so it's a prefab building. And what we did is we actually deconstructed the building, rotated it at 90 degrees so that it's featured prominently along um, Robertson Boulevard. And it becomes a gateway into this um, retail corridor that we use to slice through the site to encourage pedestrian um, traffic through this mega block and also allowed for space for this 10,000 square foot ballroom space. Working through this project with the client, um, they asked us to compete for a competition for the project that's actually on the corner of the site and we won that project and it became known as the Birdcage. So this is another project that takes inspiration from the LGBTQ community in which we're building in. It is a two-story re um, retail project that has a below grade speak easy and it's expected to be completed in 2023 and it is also seeking lead gold. And here's some views and inspiration. And the nice thing about working on a project that's adjacent to one you're already working on is you can make sure there's design continuity across the board. Next is a confidential competition project in Hollywood. It is a creative office space, half a million square feet, and also has recording studios. And on this deck, um, that you will see in the next couple of slides, it has a performance venue. Um, on the upper right is an example of a visioning session of how we got to a vision statement and guiding principles with the client. We actually did this project virtually in the pandemic. So we used Miro and pasted our virtual pasties on it to help them think of different ideas of how the project could serve the community, serve the stakeholders, the environment, and live up to the goals for the project. Here's some finished views of, or some finished renderings of the project. Um, we also did persona mapping because it's a mixed use project. We wanted to make sure we were thinking about all the different users in the project, how they would move through the space. Um, and we wanted to incorporate a lot of green space because as a lot of us know, Hollywood is very, um, let's call it a concrete jungle. Um, there's not a lot of outdoor space. And so this is actually an elevated deck that is open to the public that people can use to have lunch and have picnics and enjoy a really great show that can happen here in this performance area. Then I moved over to HOK and I'll quickly go through a few projects. And our HOK LA practice, we do a lot of different um, different sectors, including hospitality, aviation, transportation, government, um, uh, science and technology building, sports, workplace interiors. We also are multidisciplinary practice. So we have landscape interiors, um, as well as lighting design, consulting, and engineering. Um, one of the projects that we're uh, just gonna be opening up a little later this year is the Mark Ridley Thomas Behavioral Health Center. It is in Los Angeles, it, and this is really exciting to me. It is an existing Paul Revere Williams, who's like one of the most famous African-American architects um, project. It was an existing hospital that had been decommissioned for over a decade. And we are reinvigorating the project, making it um, a one-stop shop for behavioral health needs. And this is the first time it's all gonna be located in one building. So there's a big social impact on this project. Um, and we're really excited to be a part of it, to have this um, building be repurposed and give it new life. And so you can see we use a lot of light colors. We use elements of biophilia through the, the super graphics, which you see on the left here, using light, airy colors to help people feel at ease during this difficult time of transition in their life. Next project is USC. 
And this one is um, going seeking lead platinum, very exciting. It's a little over 100,000 square feet. It's meant to be a um, focal point and a living lab for sustainability, for sustainability um, practices in USC. And it's meant to also be a benchmark for future architecture projects there. And we really wanted it to feel transparent, to showcase the technology that's being used in the space. And we used a lot of glazing, which you can see, so you can actually look in and see the innovation and research that's happening in this project. And that's it. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> There's some, 10 minutes. <laughs> yeah, just amazing work. And I'm really wildly impressed with the scope and the scale of the work from, you know, the tiny little sort of birdcage project to this, what was it, 1600 room? Yeah, room? yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, Daisy, thank you so much for presenting that and, and really knocking my socks off. Um, <laughs> Jenny? I'm really sorry to ask you to follow a daisy, but <laughs> will you? <laughs> yeah, let me see. It says one participant can share the time. Yes, yes. So meanwhile, uh, are there any uh, keen observations uh, or a question for a daisy as Jenny is setting up? I think I have one more. What um what would you like to ask, Abigail? Um, well, before I do, I would just I think I speak for all of us when I say we're really honored to have you all here. Um, I definitely didn't think I'd see the day where I was in the same Zoom meeting as the ECC president, but here we are. Um I just wanted to ask I, I know that you mentioned or it was mentioned that you were a mentor ma'am for um aspiring architects and interior designers. And uh I guess the question is when you seek out someone who wants to be mentored by you or yeah like if someone comes to you for mentorship what do you expect from them like what is your criteria for accepting them or not to be honest i don't have a criteria um i've been recommended to be mentors through friends who have a young daughter who's excited about architecture to um speaking at events like this and people will reach out through linkedin or other means um but i'm always an advocate for mentorship because as you'll see in our panel i did not have that much mentorship in the architecture space i had to look outside of that and so it's really important for me to give back and provide mentorship and i rarely ever I've never said no. So I just, I wanna help as much as I can. And I leave it up to the student to kind of decide on how engaged and kind of what kind of questions to craft that mentorship process. Thanks much, Adese. Hey, I think um, Jenny is ready to present. So um, are you ready to take it away, Jenny? Yes, please. Okay. I'm Thank concerned so about much. time as a yeah. project yes. manager oh, I am. You just start from right now, so. doesn't, yeah, don't worry. Right. So. Um, First, I want to say thank you, Peggy and Mark. Um, this has been it's a great opportunity. Um, and uh, Mark and Peggy asked us to talk about our career path, design philosophy, and body of work. And I'm going to start, I'm going to go fast, with uh, my education. I was born, raised in Merida, Yucatan, Mexico, and I received my degree in architecture from La Universidad Autónoma de Yucatan in 1999. Um, it took me a bit longer than five years to finish college, as you can see, so different path than most. I was hired immediately after uh, graduating by a small firm called Duarte Aznar Arquitectos, where I work mainly on sports projects. This one here is an Olympic training facility. I worked on this one in 2000, mainly doing graphics. Um, then I... Um, work in 2001 on a multi-activity court. Um, I, I think an important thing um, on this is we always used uh, the materials that were available, natural ventilation, natural lighting, and every one of our projects. And um, this is the last project I worked while living in Mexico. It uh, was in 2002, and it was the restoration of a public market uh, from the 1940s. So that's where my, my uh, journey started. And then I moved to the US in 2002. 
And in 2005, I was hired by Canon Design and I'm there <laughs> um, until now, today. Um, and uh, just for context, we're a global firm with 19 offices, approximately 1,100 people um, across the globe. I, um, our design philosophy, I'm uh, very different from, um, from my days. I, I run a practice and I manage projects. So I'm speaking about the design philosophy for Canon Design and in stems uh, from the purpose to help people continuously flourish. We look at it uh, at everything using the empathy lens, understanding user student needs, and also looking at the needs of the community, the society, and, and everything surrounding the campus, including the environment. We understand that when we make a decision on one, it's gonna affect all the other ones. Um, and although we've we're known for winning many uh, awards on design and recognized architecturally uh, for uh, many beautiful structures, we believe that this is about life. This is what most what's most important: the people who learn, heal, live, work, uh, discover, and experience joy in the spaces that that we create. That we all help. Uh, conceive and build. And our process, we do this by engaging students, faculty, facilities, and maintenance, as well as the community in our design process that makes our process um, um, inclusive and help us uh, close the gap. Um, our designers use a combination of, I mean, this is for students, so I want to share this with you that they all use a combination of digital and physical models to develop multiple options to get reactions from the client in a short period of time. This is with the goal to understand the client's preferences and for the design team to um, uh, understand what shapes, orientation, and, and proportions work best for the site. Um, when it comes to uh, software we use, Rhino, Revit, Grasshopper to explore design op options, uh, Sapphira to analyze energy effic efficiency of the concept design at a very early stage. Um, and we also do V-Ray, our team does V-Ray twin motion for renderings and animations. This is an actual example of a project that is currently under construction. This is the Santa Monica College Math and, and Science building and um, I worked on, on this, I'm working on that project. This is an example of how we utilize Sapphira to study the impact of solar radiation on the facades and have, um, we obtain data uh, uh, on, on what scheme works the best. You know, we have actual numbers and that help our, helps our client decide, you know, which one uh, functions best um, when it comes to energy uh, performance and also which one has the, the, the smallest fo footprint in this case, we chose uh, B. My focus personally for the last 16 years has been um, helping higher education clients transform their campuses. And um, I work with incredibly talented subject matter experts with deep knowledge in student life, science, health, education, uh, libraries, you name it. We have a very deep pool of experts at Canon Design. And I'm only gonna show two projects. Um, this is the Student uh, Recreation Center expansion at UC Riverside. Um, it's a, a lead gold course. Is, um, it's a very beautiful project where, uh, we driven by students in this expansion um, and is focused on basic needs, health education, has a teaching kitchen, uh, a nutrition classroom, uh, has massage therapy and, and fitness and recreation. It's, it was a, a very a, in, important project for us because one of the aspects to consider for me important is this is the original rec center that Canon Design um, worked on, designed and built in 1993. 
In 2009, the client came back to us and asked us to work on their expansion. And um, that's the product. This is one of my favorite views. You see all the, the programming on the pool side. Um, the screen that you see, uh, the, um, the wave that moves around the, the build envelope is actually modeled after the sun, how the sun um, behaves in that, in that part of the site. Um, this is a view from the interior, how it's very open and you can see all different activities in the background. You see the, the rock climbing wall and, and, and just fitness, open fitness and the jogging track going around. This is the last project uh, we finished in 2020, actually during the pandemic. Um, and is the Kaiser Permanente, the first Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine. And um, very cool about this project, the vision originated from the idea that Kaiser uh, was gonna be able to redefine the medical education and healthcare delivery. Our client wanted to create a system that would provide um, students with wholeness, a holistic approach to education, physical and mental health. Um, this facility brings the opportunity uh, for this client to advance their culture teaches its own, uh, own uh, doctors, promote the hands-on learning that we all need nowadays. And, um, and it's, uh, the main goal is uh, they want an environment that is uh, collaborative, uh, caregiving, and, um, and approach an approach that strengths uh, the community ties. Uh, it, you can't see everything here, but it, at the bottom right, there's, that's the kitchen um, and it's, it serves the community as well, brings the community over on the left-hand side, there is the uh, yoga and meditation area. They're again, promoting wholeness. And, um, and the bottom, uh, top right image at the right side, you can see what we call a flex class classroom that proved to be very uh, useful during COVID. It, we were able to do a, hybrid uh, teaching, not knowing that we were designing for something that was coming up. <laughs> so, um, and I leave you all with this, um, this uh, really um, thinking every day about what impact you're going to do in the world is what is gonna get you through a school of architecture and, and whatever you wanna go. Thank you. Well, I don't think I'm ever more inspired than by words of Jane Goodall. Thank you so much. I really appreciate feeling that inspiration and, and that you're conveying that for us. Wonderful, wonderful projects, Jenny. Thank you. Uh, I'm hoping Don is ready to show us a few things. Yeah, hello. I will share my screen now and I'll just do the, the full screen mode. Can everyone see my screen? Yes? Not yet. Not yet? Oh, Not yet. Okay. Nope. let me go back. There we go. All Perfect. right. There we go. <laughs> All right. All right. So a little bit about me. Um, I thought I would start off with this picture because I was, I think I was six years old and uh, I was helping my father build a deck. So I don't think I knew what architecture was when I was six, but I always had this um, love of making things and understanding how things were made. So, and also like uh, Daisy, I love playing with Legos and I didn't actually, and also a lot of the more like Tonka toys and things that I wasn't supposed to because I was a girl. <laughs> so uh, you'll see that later on. So um, my trajectory was that I got my Bachelor of Architecture from the New Jersey Institute of Technology. Um, and during that time, um, I worked at two architecture firms and I learned a lot. I actually learned AutoCAD from the first internship that I had. And then after school, I kind of decided that it wasn't enough. I wanted to know more about design. The schooling was wonderful, but I needed a little bit more. And I wanted something a little bit different. So I decided on um, the Rhode Island School of Design because it was such a great school. It was nearby, not too, too far away. And they had the landscape architecture program. So 
I didn't really know anything about landscape architecture, but really just wanted something um, to open my eyes to something that was architecture, but not. <laughs> so I spent two years there. And then after that, um, I wanted another new adventure. So I wanted to come to Los Angeles. So I've been here for now 15 years. I worked in two firms. Uh, SWA was the first. And then um, Studio MLA is where I currently am. So as my like design inspiration and kind of how I went to the trajectory of architecture, I've loved architecture since I was probably in fifth grade. And um, I think my first um, real love of landscape really is shown by these examples. There's a book by Kenneth Frampton, which is Studies in Tectonic Culture. There was a chapter about Carlos Scarpa, who is the bottom um, left image, uh, who creates these wonderful details of old and new things together. Um, really beautiful, wonderful spaces that are interior and exterior designs that come together. And then um, I have, was fortunate enough to go to Siena for school, Siena, Italy, and um, the wonderful piazzas um, is, uh, was a really big inspiration and seeing how they've stood the test of time and the evolution of that space over time is it's amazing. Um, and then there's projects like the bottom right, which I just happened upon at school one day, and it was an escalator that's carved into a hillside uh, designed by two gentlemen from Spain. Uh, so my, the beginning of um, where I started with architecture, as I mentioned, uh, was the first firm that I worked at was um, a firm that did retail architecture, kind of the cookie cutter. So not incredibly that interesting, but I learned a lot from everyone there. Second, I've done um, things like a YMCA in New Jersey, and then I've worked on homes um, at a small firm in New York City. And then when I came over here at SWA, uh, architecture and landscape were really one thing. We did pavilions, we did all these cityscapes and, and massive projects throughout the country and also in China. So where I am today is Studio MLA. We're a, um, a really diverse firm. We're about 40 people. We have an office in downtown LA as well as uh, San Francisco. Um, you can see here, this is actually a picture of us pre-COVID from International Women's Day, where we all came together, we're holding these signs um, with quotes for like, I, I think it's like, I press for progress for women. And our leadership. So uh, this is a picture from our website of, of our, the leaders of our firm. So there's about six principles, um, diverse. Um, we have a lot of female leads and then um, two associate uh, principals, me and my uh, colleague Kush. Um, so uh, it's, a, it's a great diverse group of people in age ranges, where they came from, what their background is. We have quite a few architects um, and uh, that have come from architecture backgrounds that went to landscape. And our fearless leader is um, Mia Lair. Um, she actually, this is uh, published really recently. We were fortunate enough to have worked on uh, the landscape all around SoFi Stadium. So it was a really amazing project. We got a lot of publicity. Um, she really has shaped a lot of Los Angeles, and I really look at her as a, a mentor, someone that has um, really someone that I've learned a lot from over the past 11 years. She's really shaped um, projects like from working on the LA River to all these projects at Inglewood and throughout. So this is the first project that I actually worked on at um, Studio MLA. It's the Natural History Museum, um, and I hope everyone has been there. It's a great space. It was actually two acres of parking lots that was transformed into the nature gardens. And uh, I started off on the construction documents, not on the design side. So with the construction documents, I worked for about two years and three phases of this project. And then I got to do construction administration. And I was probably, I was only in my maybe mid twenties when I was doing this. And it was a lot of fun. Uh, I was there pretty much like every day, one of the best experiences I had was cre the creation of a pond. I was out on site. I actually tagged probably about a hundred boulders, um, just like Legos, uh, every single one, the length, the width, the height. And I made a, a legend of them. And then I got to place every single one of them with the contractors, lifting it, as you can see in the bottom left with the cranes, directing them like 
I want it a little bit to the left, I want it a little bit to the right, turn it around, put it down right here. So that was an amazing experience to work with all of these gentlemen on the site that have a lot more experience than me, but I had to do my job. And you can see on the bottom right, a picture of me pointing at the wonderful stream that was created after a few years. One of the second projects I wanted to show you is the Broadway Trade Center. Um, I worked with um, Givening Architects. I was the um, manager and also lead designer on this project. It's in um, downtown, it was the May Company building. So this goes back to the whole like transformation of spaces and evolution. It was, uh, you can see on the bottom left, there's this rooftop that has covered with mechanical equipment in like probably this was 2000, whatever. But on the right side, back in the 1920s, it was actually a roof that had people enjoying it. And what we did was create a two acre public park in the sky. So unfortunately it didn't get built and it's still, um, I think being, it's trying to be sold right now. But the idea was that it was supposed to be like the antithesis of Facebook where everyone could actually meet <laughs> for real. And now the story is, is that someone wants to buy it and make it the physical manifestation of the metaverse. So it's kind of become a full circle moment from Facebook to metaverse and what that actually means. So it's really interesting. There was um, uh, pools, there was public gardens, uh, restaurants, um, and uh, a big stage. The next is a very small project. This is the Hauserworth Gallery in downtown LA. So you can see the picture on the left. It was an old mill building. And you can see that's the exact same picture on the right. We transformed this space from this old mill to an art gallery with a restaurant. It's a public promenade open to everyone. And we put an oak tree and native plants and seating areas in the space. And uh, this next one is first in Broadway Park in downtown LA. We were the lead, um, lead, desi lead design and landscape architects on the project. We were the um, principals and primary consultant for the city and we worked with OMA. This project hopefully will get built in the near future, but um, right now it's on hold. And then finally, just to show you the real variety of what landscape architects do, the last project I wanted to touch upon is the UC Irvine Vision Plan. So uh, like Jenny, I've done a lot of college work and this one was actually in UC Irvine where we transformed 1500 acres of a campus into um, a connected open space network. So, um, and also created a botanical garden. So this is in phase one, hopefully going under, under construction this year, but we created master plan guidelines on the bottom left where I got to write a 200 page book about how to make this garden a reality. Um, we also create physical models that are a lot of fun still. And then we also uh, created the animations. We use Lumion and Revit and Rhino to create 3D models of the landscape spaces so that they can be funded and um, come to life. So that is it. So hopefully that shows you a really good variety of something a little bit different uh, from architecture <laughs> and a path that is also really open and there's a lot of wonderful challenging things in landscape architecture. John, I think that uh, your projects show exactly that and I couldn't be happier to see a little bit of your very earliest experiences. I think one of the, the kinds of questions that we've tossed out at you that you just answered is how did you get into this? And, you know, the picture of the six-year-old you climbing up a, a deck your dad was building. You know, that's, that, really, that really answers it. And <clears throat> the second point, I think Adese mentioned too, that <clears throat> you were Lego aficionados. So I think um, that also uh, plays into the sort of childlike spirit that I think most architects continue to, to, to practice with. So. Thank you. I really appreciate seeing those aspects, Don. And I mean, SoFi Stadium, it just doesn't get any more exciting for those of us that are in Los Angeles. So wonderful. Kim, would you like to present some projects? Yes, thank you. Hello, everyone. Hi, Kim. Let's see. I am going to make sure I have the right screen. OK. Hopefully you all can see that. Yes. 
It's working great. So thank you, wonderful to be here. And thank you so much, Mark and Peggy. Um, and I wanna share a little bit of my background and where I've been and how I've gotten to where I am, sort of taking you through a journey of my different paths and opportunities and really using four projects that were real instrumental in my uh, journey and my career that kind of came at very opportune times and identifying how those projects and when they happened and what was happening around them really shaped uh, where I was going and where I've ended up. So let me see, I'm sorry. So just to start, I kind of fast forwarded to college, <laughs> graduating. I also played with Legos. I think it's probably a fairly common occurrence for architects. Um, my brother was an engineer, so he used to build uh, planes out of Legos while I would sit there and build houses. So that's how we knew where we're, what our paths were. Um, I graduated from USC back in 2002, so I've been uh, working professionally for 20 years now. And um, right out of school, I went to work for Mark J. Payone Architects, which was a very small practice in Orange County. There was about six of us total. And so that was a very unique opportunity to be at a, at a firm with a very small group of people, very intimate. And right away, I was being thrown onto projects um, with a lot of responsibility and a lot of opportunity as to what I could do, which was, which was fantastic. Uh, you'll see in the background here, this is a master plan for a K-8 school that I worked on with a group of people. And um, so I started doing education work right out of, of, out of uh, university here. I really fell in love with that work and what it offered and being able to think about education and how it influenced, um, in this case, children and how it influenced society. And uh, my, my husband and I got married in 2003. I didn't have that in there. But um, I would say having grown up in Fresno, having gone to school at USC, I was kind of bored with California. I needed a new adventure. I was looking for something to do with my life. We were young, we were married, and we needed something else. So I told my husband, we're moving, let's get out of here. And we moved to Chicago. And um, this was, I would say, sort of point number one where I think my career really took a different direction. And I joined Ross Barney Architects. It was Ross Barney Jankowski at the time. Uh, that was led by Carol Ross Barney. So I then went to work for a firm that was about 20 to 30 people led by a female designer as the owner of the firm. And so she's most notably, or she's most well known these days, I would say for the Chicago Riverwalk that you see in the background here and all of that work. Um, I had the pleasure of working on the master plan for that project and implementing uh, one of those uh, sections of the Riverwalk as well while I was there. And what really drew me to Carol and the practice there was uh, Carol has this design philosophy that design excellence is a right and not a privilege. And I just love that. I love the philosophy. I love the work she did. She won the Thomas Jefferson Award from the AIA the second year I worked there, which as a 25 year old, I had no clue what that meant, but it was a very uh, notable award that was about people that dedicate their careers to public architecture. And I decided on the spot after joining them that I was going to dedicate my career to public architecture. And so it was really this idea of wanting to work on projects that, that influence the greater good, that gave back to communities and to society. And so that's why I've really stuck with higher education as a core area of, of my practice and what I do, because I wanna be able to touch many lives and bring uh, something that brings people joy and brings experiences to uh, improve lives. Um, this is the Jewish Reconstructionist Congregation. So this is project number one that really changed my career trajectory. I uh, started working on it about a year or two, about a year and a half after joining. And I was helping to document the project and uh, was really learning from someone on the project. Well, the person who was leading it left the firm and it was about to go into construction. So that meant my boss came to me and said, Kim, we need you to oversee construction on this project. And I thought, oh my gosh, I'm gonna be in over my head. I don't know what I'm doing. And she said, don't screw it up. But she used 
more colorful language, let's just say. <laughs> and so this was my opportunity. I said, okay, I'm not going to screw it up. I'm going to learn as much as I can, and I'm going to knock this out of the park. I know how important this is of a project. Let me do everything I can. So I had an opportunity to learn from people in my office, oversee construction, work with contractors really for the first time, work directly with the clients to make sure they were happy. And this was an amazing project. It's um, actually a AIA award winner. It won a committee on uh, environment, or sorry, COAT Committee on the Environment Top 10 Green Award. Um, and so, I don't know, one of my first major projects I worked on won, you know, international awards. So that was a little bit jarring for me as well. Um, but this was really a project about sustainability, about taking the Jewish Reconstructionist congregation and their ideals of uh, tikkun olam, which is a saying in Hebrew that means repair the world. And that was their motivation. That was the inspiration for the project. So everything about the project was about how we are going to use materials and uh, systems that would help repair the world. So this is a lead platinum project as well. And some of the materials you see, some of the uh, details that really went into how this could come about and on a very tight budget as well. So learned a lot through that. Well, 2008 was an interesting year and some of us I'm sure on the call experienced it. Uh, there was a great recession in 2008. I went from working at an office, a firm that had about 30 people to probably over the course of a few months was down to about 20. And um, I knew I had a pretty uh, solid position there because of the work I was doing and I was actively working on, on this project at the time, but it was pretty scary. And I saw that there was a need to win work. Uh, the only way out of feeling like there was some, some level of fear that you may not have a job in another month was to win more work. So that's where I kind of took the next opportunity. I said, okay, I'm going to get more involved with our marketing director. I'm going to understand what the projects are that we're trying to go after. I'm going to start going online and looking for opportunities. I'm going to make sure the projects I'm working on are being submitted for awards and we have opportunities for press. And I did all of this on my day off because at the time we had been furloughed to four days a week of pay. And so I came in every Friday to work and I sat there and I just worked on anything I could do to help us find work. That I would say transformed my career almost as much as anything else because it really gave me a new insight as to what it took to run an office and how to, how to get work. Uh, the next project that sort of transformed things for me was University of Minnesota Duluth uh, Civil Engineering Building. This is the second project I worked on that won an AIA uh, National Coat Top 10 Green Award. So. Uh, clearly, I had taken everything I learned from that first project and uh, applied it to this one. What's wonderful about this project is that it's a civil engineering building. So we were able to take all of these materials and ideas of materiality and expose it. This is a building that's about living, uh, learning on display. And so you'll see the recycled pickle barrels for the scuppers. It's actually, it's Minnesota. It rains a ton. So when it's raining, these get filled with water. That water spills out into these wonderful cistern areas with French drains underneath. And all of this is a living ecosystem of a building. And it utilized different systems. You can see here from the outside of the building. Uh, you know, those are, are, you'll see in the, the photo on the right there, the upper right, those um, tiebacks that are for tilt-up construction, for concrete tilt-up construction. And we left them, but you don't normally leave those. You take them off after building it, but we wanted the students who were learning here to be able to understand how buildings were made and how systems came together. So it's a really fun project to understand all of these things and work with different materials. At the end of the project, I was actually pregnant. <laughs> and so I had a child and that was a decision for me to actually move back to California. That's where I decided, okay, this has been fun in Chicago, but I want to go back where it's warm. <laughs> and so that uh, was an interesting uh, fact for me because I started a new job with Canon Design back in Los Angeles in 2011 uh, when my daughter was about five months old. And so that is a scary proposition as well. And I'm sure some of you may have children, some of you are going to have children while you're working in the profession, 
or doing any profession and starting a new job with a young child is um is a little bit scary because you don't know what people are going to think of you you don't know if you're, they're going to give you responsibilities you're looking for uh but i will say that you know i had the pleasure of working with jenny delgado who you heard from earlier and it was a wonderful experience i was able to do a lot of great work um enough so that i felt comfortable having child number two in 2013 while i worked there so but it is it did it definitely changed my perspective and it changed the workload it changed how efficient I am with my time and how I get my work done. And so a project that I worked on while I was there that really stood out was uh, University of Utah Lausanne Studios. And this is a project that houses 400 students in a residence hall style living. There's actually three different models of um, living uh, areas within the building. And it's combined with an entrepreneurial center. So it has a maker space and it's really this place for students to come together to learn from each other, to start new businesses, to work on products and be innovators and entrepreneurs and uh, do all this fantastic work. And I really started to love student housing, what, what the angles were that could come with student housing and how that supported students, as well as the academic side and how that all came together. And I would say this is where I really cemented a close relationship with a mentor of mine at, at Canon Design, um, who was the uh, really directing student housing for the firm, Lynn Denninger. So that was a fantastic opportunity for me to work with her and learn from her. And I really at that point decided I had, I had been able to do fantastic work, but I wasn't quite getting the experiences I wanted to be a little bit more hands-on on the projects uh, directing them, working with the clients, and really leading design as well. And so unfortunately, I had to say goodbye to my friend Jenny, <laughs> but we still get to work together today doing things like this. <laughs> um, so in 2015, I joined Steinberg Hart. Uh, what my interesting story there is within a year of joining, I was promoted to principal. Um, it was about a year right after I joined that the, the partner who had hired me, who oversaw uh, higher education quit. <laughs> and I thought, oh no, what's going on? And about a week later, after finding out he was leaving, I was promoted and I thought, okay, well, this is fine. See you later. No, I'm just kidding. Um, it was actually a little bit jarring because it meant that I was still somewhat new to the practice. I had a lot to learn and I was now in this, this leadership role and I had to quickly get myself up to speed with what that was going to be and really find my voice as a leader in the firm and how I would lead projects and lead teams. And so that, um, that next year, then 2016, is when uh, we'd also won the Harvey Med College McGregor Computer Science Building, uh, which this was a really special project to me. And I'm very happy and lucky that this project took so long uh, because it, it really needed that time and thought to be able to come together, I think, in the way it did. Um, this is a college that has about 800 students. My brother is actually an alma mater, so it was very personally special to me. But it was also this project that was sort of the first that I was overseeing as a principal, that I was able to work with my team and develop into something that we knew was going to be really special and momentous for this campus. It takes a very outdated mid-century modern uh, campus and really turns it to be more about the community and how it interfaces with the community rather than this insular product on campus. And developing uh, key areas that would uh, bring students together, really take down the barriers of STEM education. Um, I'm sure as many of you know, STEM education has this history of being mostly male uh, and uh, can be quite intimidating to people that don't feel like they belong. So whether that's minorities or women or anyone that feels like they're not a part of that community. So the entire project was about how to break down those barriers and create spaces that felt very welcoming and really felt like you were walking into this um, you know, educational space that was going to be about collaboration and working together. And we finished this also in the pandemic, which was interesting, and this opened in 2021. Um, during that time, while I was working on that project and others, uh, a lot of things happened for me. Uh, I was promoted to partner in 2018, and so I was able to then um, have ownership in the firm and join the partnership group and the stakeholders. 
Uh, the following year, I took over as a higher education practice leader for the firm for our seven offices across the country. And so I helped to organize all of our higher education work that we're doing and uh, my partners in other offices and what's going on. And then I joined our board of directors for the firm. There's five of us um, in 2020, so just about two years ago. And I'm our first female uh, member of the board of directors in our 70 year history and only the second female partner and the first female partner that rose from the ranks of being a Steinberg Hart employee to be partner. So things that I'm very proud of and I look forward to the future and what it holds as well. So thank you very much. Oh, oh, I wanted to leave you with just, I also have been very involved throughout this whole time with organizations outside of what I do on a day-to-day -day basis at work. And I think that's important when you're looking for your leadership opportunities and growth and where you might be going. It's not just about work and what's in front of you. It's about how you're influencing, uh, I think, other areas and other organizations as well. So I'm very involved in this organization called SCUP, which has been great. It's great for networking and learning. And I encourage you all to expand your horizons. Thank you. Thank you, Kim. This is also really inspiring. And um, I think your story is told from a project basis. So it's nice to see how your progression evolved through your project. So also very, very enlightening and inspiring. Thanks to everybody on the panel um, <clears throat> for just some really beautiful and inspiring work. So we have a few questions that we've sort of been thinking about, been working with. And so if there's no uh, further ado, I'd like to ask uh, some of these questions. You are more than welcome, um, all panelists to chip in um, on the answer. But I think Jenny said something about, she could give us uh, a start on this question. So here goes. Describe a particularly meaningful experience that influenced your work. Um. Yeah, so I, uh, I, I thought I mentioned a little bit about this in my very uh, short presentation, um, but it was the boss I had right after graduating um, that um, learning to find inspiration in our roots, looking for design drivers in the way we want it. Um, natural ventilation, natural lighting, how the rain can be experienced um, through the building. And in thinking about how will this or that will make people feel in the space, the, the thinking of what are the users, people living here, how are they gonna feel in this space? Um, I think I've thinking that I've taken that with me wherever I go is influenced, the wanting to make a difference, the wanting of um, always like to give the extra mile and go the extra mile for, for everything we do. I mean, it's just a base. Wonderful, wonderful. So looking to your roots, anybody else have any experiences that were um, something that you would like to share with us? Um, I can share. I think even looking at it kind of more in a mundane kind of way, I've always been ex um, really influenced and kind of I enjoy watching people and how they're using a space. And so even to this day, like I'll go back on a project that I've already built and look at how people are using the space and, you know, thinking about what in my head the intent was, but then actually how it's being used. I take that information that influences the next project. And I bring that forward to say, like, okay, that was successful or that wasn't successful, but just looking at how people use the space on projects that I've designed and also going into spaces. I think it's kind of funny. And I'm sure the other ladies on this calls have this experience too. Like when we go to lunch, at work and we're all like, we sit down at a table, this is obviously pre-COVID and we're all quiet and everyone, all the architects are like, we're just geeking out, looking at the space and like using that. And we're always analyzing in our heads, like, okay, well, that looks weird or that looks great. Well, I need to remember that for the next project. And all those little nuggets we take forward and they influence the next space that we design. So people watching is Basically, kind of yeah. <laughs> exciting and interesting thing to do, yeah. <clears throat> specifically if it's watching 
people in your own projects. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think you have to add to that. Um, I think it's I, what I really, the experience of seeing people use the space that you design is so amazing. And so like, I think, especially like at the public projects that I think all of us are able to do years pass and to see that how people use the space is, is just so thrilling and so heartwarming. Um, I've like seeing kids use uh, the pond at NHM or the rock that I put someplace. It, it's really, it's wonderful a thing. And it's also, I think in landscape alone, just the evolution of a design because it's not, it's not static and things are constantly changing. Plants are growing. Some plants may die, but the things get worn out. And that has really shaped the way I think about space and think about what design can be. Wonderful. Um, looking back, <clears throat> what was the one takeaway from your education that led to your role today? I can start. Any also, yeah. Um, I think more than anything, being curious, like always wanting to know more and the desire to make an impact in my community um, are the first things I, um, I identify as leading me to my role today. Um, the second, I would say, um, in all honesty, and this is, you know, for all of you that are going to school right now, I was not the most gifted student when he came to design. I wasn't, I love design. I do, I, I really think that we can change the world with what we do, um, but I am too pragmatic for that. I'm like, you know, we gotta finish. This is not gotta be on time and all of the kind of things. And, and to be a designer, you gotta take your time to see things evolve, right? So, um, so one of my professors identified that I was stronger in the professional practice in the business area and in construction administration areas. And that helped me understand where in the profession I could make a bigger impact. And, and I think, you know, the takeaway is always where an accepting, I guess, and understanding where your gifts are to be able to make an impact with what you can offer in this profession. You know, we can be designers, managers, because um, many, many, many things. We don't have to all be designers. That's right. There's, there are, uh, many, many talents and abilities that are needed in architecture. Right. Um, right, right, right. Um, <clears throat> that yes. said, um, Daisy, I know you kind of come from the design side. Um, yeah. Was there some sort of takeaway from your education that led to your, your specialization in design? Yeah, um, I think one of the things that really helped me make the transition from college into professional space is while I was in college, I, A, I come from a very overachieving family. Like I have a master's degree and everyone else has something higher than that, PhDs and juris doctorates and all this stuff. So um, the bar was high, you had to get A's. And if you got a B, it was like, why didn't you try harder? So anyway, that's my little bit about my background. And so in studio, I started to think about my professors as clients and making that correlation. And so if my objective is to get an A, right? But I also wanna design something that's true to me. And so I would think of them as a client, like what can I do that incorporates my vision and goals, but also take their comments in, but weigh them against my overall concept. And if they weren't getting something, that meant there was a disconnect with my concept. I didn't take it personal as like saying I couldn't do it, but it's like, okay, now I have to reassess what my concept of my ideas are because they're not translating. If I think it's red and they tell me it's blue, then there's something wrong there. And so then the next time we'd have a critique, the professor might say, oh, it's purple. So we're getting there. We're getting closer to the red that I want. And I would just kind of use that as a metric to get closer to kind of what I wanted to make sure it was translating across. And I think that helps carry me in the professional space as well, because, you know, we do have clients as the reality of the profession. It'd be nice to be able to pay for my own projects and design whatever I want, but that's not the reality. So that tool kind of helped me balance it and prepare me for the workplace. Okay, that's really profound to hear. 
um, from the design side of the house as well as the practice side of the house. So um, thank you both on that. Um, <clears throat> hey, Don, what were some of the challenges you faced in your career journey? So um, I actually like one of my answer to this question was going to be what something that Kim mentioned already in her presentation, which it actually is the big one was the recession was a big challenge and it, it happens. It happens. You know, it's going to happen a few times during your year. There's going to be times when there's not enough work out there. We're in a service industry. So I think um, to add on to what Kim said, being open to different experiences really allowed me to um, to sort of not really really change gears, but to really think of like the opportunities that we've all been mentioning that are beyond just sitting down at your desk and doing your job. I try, I did the same thing that Kim did and I was there all the time at my desk, even though we were on furlough, just looking for and seeing like, I'm here, I'm here. <laughs> but I also like was looking at Craigslist <laughs> for jobs at that time. And um, so that was one. And I think the other thing is, um, since we are a service industry, it's a challenge of what the client wants versus what you want to do. And I would say to like all the students, like really, really like take a look at what you're doing and you have so much opportunity to like really go there with what you're doing right now because you're not bogged down with that, which in the end is a challenge and a great challenge, but it also kind of like it stinks sometimes. <laughs> so really like think outside the box and go there with what you're doing because it's going to open your eyes and don't be like bogged down by, you know, what your critic says or what you like really try different things because that will allow you to answer questions that a client will have later on um, when you're when you're in the real world. <laughs> So staying open to possibilities yeah. and yeah, yeah, yeah. And in looking for um, different adventures within the and, profession. Yeah. And I think also it's like, I think I, one of my professors told me once while I was researching something, I said that, um, I think I said that I just happened upon something, which was that escalator project. I didn't happen upon it. I was doing the work. I was finding things. So it's really dedicating yourself because this job is hard. So dedicating yourself and the time, it takes a lot of time to do yeah. what we do. It does. It takes a lot of time to be educated in it. It takes a lot of time to be competent and to develop yeah. specialization. So and that's I a great story. Add to that Tell from me. the point of view of uh, licensing, right? Um, in, in just English as a second language when I came to this country, right? And um, I had the time there, but my English wasn't that great. So it was really hard to get through the test. So, um, and then um, also culturally, uh, I was taught to do whatever older people said we should do. And the fact that um, it was very hard to express myself in a room full of men. And all of those things were really hard in the beginning. Uh, and um, so it's just to, to uh, push yourself, um, push and push because yes, whatever you wanna do, you can do it. it takes a lot of effort. So sometimes for some of us, a lot, a lot more effort than it would take um, someone that was born and raised here, but um, but it's, it's no impediment, I just. So uh, Jenny, maybe to play off of your, your comments, you know, I think being young and female <laughs> for most of my career, I'm, I'm finally catching up in age, I think. <laughs> but, you know, I've been in, in, in positions at firms and uh, within companies and working with clients and contractors where you know, I've showed up and they're like looking at the guy at the table as mm -hmm. the leader because maybe it's a male and maybe they're older than me. And I'm like, no, 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 I'm I, over here. I'm, I'm the principal, I'm in charge. <laughs> and that's something that I often have to point out to people or remind them of. And so I think, I think in addition to some of those challenges, it's also been uh, some of the having to, um, uh, manage up, right? So sometimes you have to manage folks that have, have more experience than you, have been around a lot longer than you. Yeah. And so 
having to understand how to do that and navigate that carefully. And, um, and I think as women, we tend to do things more carefully because we know that if we come across too bold or too brash, that that can backfire. So uh, we've sort of learned how to navigate these things in a way. But um, so I think those are some of the challenges that I've seen as well is or how too do you giggly or too smiley or too yes, nice do too... something, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so I hope that's something we're changing. And I think that's a question later, so I won't get too far into it. But that that has been a challenge is that sort of perceptions, right? Perceptions come first and then the reality sort of comes after once you're you have to kind of prove yourself to people every time. Right, right. <clears throat> okay. Yeah, maybe you can um, start us off on this one too. Um, how did you identify role models or mentors? So I, you know, I found myself pretty darn lucky, to be honest. And I don't think how lucky, I didn't realize how lucky I was until later in my career, because my second job out of school, so when I had been about two years after graduating, uh, as I mentioned, I was working for a female design leader uh, with you know national recognition. And so to me, I worked in this firm that was just, it is, it was what it was. And she was a female architect leading this practice. Everyone knew who she was. Uh, you know, there was no consideration as to how that worked. And uh, she spent a lot of time telling us about her journey and how she got there and uh, what she went through. She was one of the founders of Chicago Women in Architecture as an organization. And I mentioned earlier to Eric in the chat, asked about Natalie Dubois, who is a female uh, design leader at SOM in Chicago. And Natalie was my boss, Carol's mentor. So Natalie would come to our office about once a month for lunch and we'd sit in our conference room and she would just share stories about sh at working at SOM and you know some horror stories <laughs> and others really positive about the work she did and so it was just wonderful i had this wonderful network of female leaders and mentors around me and then i came back to la where i thought i was like la it's super progressive and i'm like oh my gosh there aren't female leaders really uh, in my presence as much so I would say that Jenny and I found each other. <laughs> we were really working side by side. And, you know, by the time I left, we were, we were co-leading um, our group together and really relying on each other. And so I think you can't always just look for somebody that's a leader around you. Sometimes you have to carve a different path or find other opportunities. So it could be your peer. It could be somebody that works in a different area from you. It could be a client. Um, I've just found inspiration from so many different women in the field. And I've had plenty of male leaders uh, or male mentors as well, which is wonderful. But there's always something a little bit missing from getting that perspective that you're looking for that. I just want somebody that understands my situation and what I'm going through. And I think we all feel that. So you can find it a lot of different places. And so you don't have to have just a leader that's going to mentor you. It can be peers, it can be others, it could be friends. Right. So taking a page out of, of Dawn's book in terms of opportunities for employment, let's go with it um, that in looking for mentors as well. Just be open. Absolutely. And you know, don't forget that you can be a mentor also. So that's, right. that's, that's the key, right. you know, when we're off looking for mentors, you have to remember who are you mentoring and who are you helping? Because it's, I think um, it goes full circle. Yeah, I, you're absolutely right. Yeah. And I think a Daisy had some, uh, you know, when we were speaking the other day, you had some wonderful comments about mentorship and how you found right. uh, your right. mentors. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I think for me, I started at um, HKS, which is commonly referred to as a good old boys firm, and it was. Um, and I was in Dallas, the headquarters, so it very much was. Um, and so it was a little difficult to find a mentor, um, especially, you know, there, there weren't a lot of people of color in the office. There weren't a lot of female um, leaders. I would see 
junior people beneath me that would come in behind me and then I'd see leadership seek them out. I was like, huh, that's odd. Um, but I looked um, for, you know, I actually came back to California. I got um, more opportunities to find mentors outside of my firm by organizations, getting involved with NOMA, getting involved with women in architecture. So that was helpful. And to Kim's point, it was really great to find mentorship in my peers because there are things that you can learn from each other. Um, and I had a few friends that graduated also from Prairie View. Um, that started in, in Dallas and we kind of became our peer mentor group and so we would talk about situations and how about you try this and how about you try that but it is great if you can find somebody that's in a leadership position to give you that insight to help you chart your course and your career into the next phase and then as I said in my presentation I got a lot of mentorship from people outside of the industry as well you know having to deal with the because it is a corporate space there are some synergies there in different creative spaces you know it doesn't have to be necessarily if you're looking for architecture it has to be an architect it can be a fashion designer, it can be someone who's a landscape designer, it can be, like Kim said, even an ownership. So you can look for different ways to kind of target who you want your mentor to be. Um, and it could be someone you have a personal relationship or someone you aspire to be like Beyonce. <laughs> oh, that couldn't, <laughs> that couldn't be a better conclusion to that. Yeah. yeah, I love that. Beyonce. Yeah, right. Please tell me you have her cell phone number or something. Yeah, a day I'm day. working on it. I'm okay. trying. <laughs> okay. Um, Kim, it sounds like you've signed up for this next question too. How has the practice environment changed today for the next generation of female practitioners? I think I, this one is... Um, it's interesting. So maybe from the perspective of those I've heard that came before me and um, actually just some of the things I heard when I was in school, which were uh, disappointing, getting back to the education side. And again, remember, this was 20 years ago. So things have changed for the better. But I remember um, having a studio where a female professor told a female colleague of mine that she needed to not act so girly because she was never going to make it in architecture. And I thought, okay. <laughs> I was told that too. Oh. It, it, it is a thing. So um, I would say my takeaway is that um, having, you know, people like us, like a Daisy, Dom, Jenny, and myself now leading firms and working in the profession, like that's just, it. I, I don't want to hear that. I don't want to see any of that. I think being yourself, being able to be genuine and being able to represent who you are, uh, representing your own personality in your work and what you do. I think those are so critical and so important. And so I value that over anything. I often see uh, maybe other women that I work with or have worked with in the past that I feel like they're trying too hard to present themselves in a certain way. And I usually pull them aside and I say, it's okay. I want to see who you are because you being genuine and being yourself is going to open yourself up so much more to these conversations with clients and what's happening and what's going on. Like, please don't feel like you have to present yourself in a way that's not your genuine day-to-day -day self. So that to me is just really important. And I try to influence everyone to do that because at the end of the day, we're, we're connecting with people. And when you're trying to be something that you're not, you're not going to connect as well. And so it doesn't, not everyone's going to like you. It's okay. We all have to let go of that. Right. But, you know, at least be yourself because we're just trying to do our best job every day. And I think people really connect with the personality and the person. And so, um, yeah, I, I definitely encourage that. And I think that's important. So I think that's how hopefully this is, opening up new opportunities for women in the profession. And it's also acknowledging things like I, I mentioned earlier, you know, I have two children. I'm very vocal about that because I know that that is uh, something that can be a deterrent and a hindrance and a challenge to women in architecture. It is not easy to raise children and be a working professional in any profession. And architecture can at times be particularly bad in that way. So I think it's um, important that more women see uh, women that have children and recognize that that is a path and an opportunity. And it's also how we're having to change 
uh, things like flexibility and work hours and where you can work. I mean, the pandemic has opened new doors as well to more flexibility. And so it's really making sure that we're paying attention to not just the things we hear, but what are those things that are particularly impacting women in careers? Because we're losing women mid career. A lot of talent, yeah. We're losing a lot of talent in the profession. And so, you know, I think we're all trying to figure out those ways to keep women in architecture and to keep them in the profession because there's so much value in that. And lastly, our clients, our clients are becoming more and more women. And so that is wonderful to see, which is why we're able to have better roles and opportunities because it's reflected in the people we're working with. So sorry, that was a lot. <laughs> no, that's great. I'm really excited and happy to hear all of all of those experiences, all of those perspectives. Um, Jenny, did you have something to add to the discussion on um, the practice environment? No, well, I, I, I got to say it was when I worked with Kim, I started learning that I didn't have to act like a man, that I didn't have to um, my entire career also trying to like do more to fight and be at the same level as as a man and you know my child used to sleep under my desk but during the summer because I had to be there instead of like taking the time to spend with her um so I am so happy to see where we're now like it's, it's moving it, it is changing and having women and leadership positions is going to help other women in architecture. So um, I'm, I'm really happy that I could, I can see that change in 20 years. Right. Right. Yeah. And to Kim's point, like our clients are changing, like regardless of their, the fact that they're male or female, the industry has shifted, you know, in all of us, that presented, we all had a through line of empathy and listening to our client and understanding their needs. You didn't hear like the cape swirling, you know, kind of Frank Lloyd Wright attitude, like I know what's best and you're going to live in it. You know, like as women, we're kind of in more intuitive by nature and we have more empathy and we tend to listen more, which clients are seeing that value translate into more successful designs, better projects, better end results for the users. And so there's actually recognizing the value of our specific point of view. So I love that, you know, both Jenny and Kim are saying like, we need to stay true to ourselves and bring our secret magic female sauce to the party. <laughs> the female sauce. Yeah. <laughs> you gotta love that. <clears throat> okay. I think we have, <clears throat> pardon me, one more question for the whole panel. But before we go to that, I want to reserve just a little bit of time at the end to ask that question. But I thought we'd throw it out to some of our audience members. I know uh, Mark has been collecting a few questions from the chat. So let's include <clears throat> some of what people are asking about. Yeah. So, uh, and I forgot who the question is from. Question is, how are you able to retain uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, how are you able to retain some of the LGBTQ history in the new design for the space at the factory? I guess this was directed at a daisy. Yes, and so I did, I replied back in the chat. What I didn't touch on is that we do have a, we've designed in a commemorative area to, that will be in the factory building just above the entrance to the um, main ballroom area. And it's a commemorative space that'll have memorabilia from the factory that'll celebrate its history. And um, people can go up to it for free to look at it and understand the history and importance and the significance of the building in the LGBTQ community. So we did incorporate that into the design. Oh, that's great Thank to hear. You. Yeah. Um, another question is, um, most of the projects demonstrated rich layers of interior design in addition to the overall building itself. How involved were each of you with the, that aspect of the projects? Uh, for the projects I shared, it 
pretty much varied um, depending on the team structure for the project. So like um, the MRT building, we did full service on that. So we did architecture, we did the interiors, as well as the um, um, lab space planning and the hospital um, planning. And so we did the lighting design on that one too. So it kind of depends on the, the needs of the clients. Other ones will work with an interior design firm. Um, mm -hmm. Like for example, the, um, oh no, we did interiors on that too. I'm trying to think of one. Uh-oh. Ah, on one, <laughs> one of the uh, one of the, the Bellevue um, residences, we worked with an interior architect for the residences that did FF&E, which is the fixture um, finish and equipment. And so they they picked up the finishes, but we did the interior architecture. So it really just depends. I'd say my favorite projects are the ones that we do all of it, right? <laughs> it's just such a complete picture of the vision and the goals of the client and the voice of what that's trying to accomplish. So I think all of the ones I showed you, cause they're my favorites, were all soup to nuts. Um, and actually one of them, I one of the civil engineering building I showed, I actually did the interiors. I did the FF&E, I did all the interiors on the project myself. <laughs> it's wow. been, uh, I dabbled in interiors for a moment. <laughs> I did I did other parts of the building too, but um, I sort of took that on because again, we're a relatively small firm. So it was an opportunity to be able to do a lot more and touch a lot more. Um, so I think on that camp for, you know, the audience to know if you want to touch everything, every aspect of a project, when you graduate, go to a small firm. True. If you go to a large firm, you're going to get, you know, stuck, I'm going to say, doing one thing for a long time. And then, then you move or graduate to the next thing. And you're going to do that same thing for a long time. And it's going to take you longer to be able to see a, a project go from beginning through and you being part of it. I mean, this is just in my experience. I agree. I think all of us work at larger firms, but I agree. <laughs> It's, it's a good experience for a hands-on experience, yeah. Right. So smaller firms, you're going to get a more uh, varied um, list yes, of things. Yes, it's by right? Like your, your yeah. teams are smaller, so you have to be more nimble, and you get the opportunity to follow things from start to finish. Like we tend to, um, at HOK, help people get licensed. And so part of that is doing your hours. And so people will raise their hand and say, oh, I need more CA hours, which is usually the thing. Um, or they right. need hours in design because they've been doing CA and we actively will move them around. But I think in smaller firms, it's just by nature of the team, it just happens and you don't have to raise your hand and ask, um, which is kind of a nice trade-off if you're someone who wants to be a well-rounded whole architect and focus on everything. Yes. Um. So I think um, there is another question from that nobody got yet, but I'm gonna go ahead and ask this one. It's not our last one. What about architecture today keeps you passionate? What are you passionate about? I guess for me, continuing to transform the lives of students. I mean, education, it's the best we can give to people on earth. And if you get a good education, you can go anywhere in the world and, and conquer anything you want. So um, that, and every time we finish a project, more so when it's a community college that's found, um, seeing the students, the opening day, when in one particular college, uh, Mission College, opening day, they walk in and start sobbing. It's like, this is, <laughs> this is why I do what I do. Yeah. yeah. Jenny, you're so right. There's nothing better than a project opening. And um, it's just the icing on the cake. And I think probably a few of us have experienced a few projects opening in the last couple of years during the pandemic that maybe didn't quite have that excitement um, that, you know, was a little bit of a bummer. And so I'm excited that we get to be maybe a bit more, uh, although we're doing a virtual panel, a little bit more back in person and see that because architecture is about people and it's about people experiencing space 
and the joy that it can bring to you know communities to the people that are living there or you know experiencing it or learning there and so for all of us i mean i think for me i will speak for myself <laughs> it's about seeing those people using this space and how it transforms their lives and how it brings joy and enlightenment and all these other wonderful characteristics to their experiences well said, Kim. Well said. Yeah, Adesa, you mentioned earlier that one of your favorite things to do is people watching. Yeah, Kim, you can totally speak for me too. Yes, I agree with both <laughs> Kim and Jenny. That feeling is so addicting, like to go in and see that like grand opening. And there's so much work that goes in the problem solving because I think that Lego background and puzzles, like I love puzzles too, and solving them and getting them to fit into a certain shape and it like all clicks and sings. And then the payoff of seeing people use that space and have it that space and live in that space is yeah. just like, I mean, I ended up talking about it. You know, like it's super exciting to be that impactful shaping skyline, shaping communities, doing these public projects. And so that I think is why you see a lot of architects doing this into their eighties, because it's just so great to be a part of that narrative shaping the environment. Yes, it's, I, I, can't agree with you more. It's just, it's addicting, it's um, enlightening, it's enriching, all of those things, all of the above. Okay, yeah. Don, I want to toss yeah. this one at you. Um, well, can I answer gonna... the last one too? Oh, well, yeah. Yes, I was going to, yes, please do. <laughs> so I just wanted to add on because we, yeah, with the, the, the seeing the space open is like amazing, but I think it's also what makes me still passionate about this whole field is that the variety of stuff we get to do. So it's like the, like from where I'm at, it's small projects to large projects, to just planning projects, to built projects. And then things like this, coming on a panel, being able to write a story about a project that you gave or giving a lecture to someone about a project or what you're passionate about, which we're kind of doing today, mentoring. So there's so many things, working with cities, doing nonprofit work and helping communities do things. Like there's so much potential and educating little kids to make them understand like, oh, an architect does this, a landscape architect does this. It's so much, there's so much variety of things that you can do on your work time, but also your spare time that um, makes this <laughs> fun and exciting um, through the years. And I think as you develop, the more, there's more opportunities for you to do a lot of stuff. Like I'm now starting to do this kind of thing more often and starting to talk about all the wonderful things that projects that I've been able to do, which I don't think I would have done before, but there's so many doors that open um, as you get more experience in the field. So it's, it is, it's, it's, it's a great variety, I think, in opportunities in, in this profession. Yeah, it's it's really um, heartening to hear that because I think we hear so much and we talk a lot and rightfully so about all of the challenges. So listening to your ideas about the rewards and watching people in the spaces and uh, it's it's very enriching to hear. So I'm hoping our students find that to be the case as well. Okay, last question. Here it is. How do we create new pathways? for aspiring women architects. And I'm hoping everybody will chime in. New pathways. I, I think it's a little bit of what I mentioned previously, which is, you know, creating, uh, creating a more open environment for people to be able to come into. Um, I think it's about uh, changing all of our perspective of what it means to be an architect and knowing that um, there's a lot of different ways that architecture can be done. I think Jenny mentioned it earlier, just, you know, you don't have to be a designer with a capital D to do architecture because guess what? It takes a whole yes. team of people to build environments and to do this work, to do design work. And so I think it's about embracing all of those different roles and opportunities. And uh, I think for all of us to better educate students coming out of school, that it isn't just about one drive or one motivation or one area that you're going to work on for the rest of your career. And so hopefully we've shared a lot of that. You know, Don went into landscape architecture 
I dabbled in interiors, you know, Jenny's on more of the practice side now. We've all done so many different things and we're probably not even done exploring all the different ways that we can influence um, the practice and what we might do. So I think it's mentorship, finding those opportunities, hearing everyone's true voice and what they have to offer. And, um, you know, and then I, I'm going to say what I shouldn't say because we all want wonderful architect graduates to come work for us, but <laughs> I'm hearing more and more so many um, people that go to school for architecture that go into other fields and other areas because architecture as an education is such a wonderful way to become a problem solver and to gain this educational experience that's yeah. really about uh, this multifaceted um, educational experience of how you how you approach problems and how you think of things. And so unfortunately, we are losing great talent to developers, to real estate, to tech, to all these other industries that have now learned robotics that we're so fantastic. So <laughs> um, yes, contractors, everyone, they're all stealing architects these days. So in a way, it's such a great profession to be in and such a great education to receive because I think we're getting back to that era of everyone realizing how, uh, how wonderful the background is of what architects come from and, and what we're learning and what we're doing on a daily basis. Kim, thank you. You've done the nicest thing to validate everything that we're doing here. We're getting an architectural education. Absolutely. <laughs> Appreciate it. <laughs> Okay, um, new pathways, Adese or Don or Jenny, ideas? I think Kim covered it all. Yeah, she, all right. she really did. <laughs> Great job of that. Yeah, hard to think, add, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's hard to, to add to that. I mean, I think if we, you know, that I think there's multiple pathways on where you go and then path, career pathways, like if you, you know, whatever you decide to do and how you move forward, I think it's important, especially for women, like we tend to not, um, speak up a lot. And I know I struggled with that a lot, kind of getting my, finding my voice within the career. Um, and so taking opportunities to kind of practice that, I think that's like a good kind of life lesson. So like when you're just in your teen groups, you know, finding ways to speak up, share your mm -hmm. ideas, understanding that when you get to the level of going to a meeting, everybody's invited for a reason and your opinion is just as good as Tom and Steve's. And so it's like you know, finding that kind of confidence to be able to speak up and share your ideas that can help lead you to kind of chart your path through the career and, and get into those leadership positions by just you know, taking risks. I think women tend to also be a little risk adverse. I know I was coming into it, um, but, you know, doing your research, putting in the long hours, like, you know, we have all done here and then Kim and Don were touching on that, to, especially during the recession. I also ramped up to get my license during that time because I was like, okay, we're shrinking. So let me learn how to be um, as good as 40 people. Like I was trying to get all the different talents so that if they're picking between one or, you know, this person or that person, it's like, well, she can do all this stuff and this guy can do two things. So we'll pick her. Uh, but finding ways I to- like, I got my license during that time too. Yeah, exactly. I was like, <laughs> let me just study everything. I also learned how to use 3D Studio Max and render. Like I just wanted to do all the things, but even outside of recession times, you know, as women in the industry taking time to learn more, do research, taking the times on the weekend to, to learn more about it. So you feel confident when you do use your voice and start kind of speaking up and becoming that leader and navigating the space um, takes a lot of, of work behind it. I think sometimes people tend to think they see us and I mean, I'm so happy to be with these esteemed women on the panel, but it takes a lot of hard work and you have to be willing to invest it. And that's just, there's no easy button, you know? And so doing the research on, on your off time doing more than your neighbor will help you get to that leadership role. Well said, well said, Adese. Um, I think we have a, a business announcement before we conclude. Um, Mark, would you like to make that? Sure, I'm okay. going to share my screen. All right. So this is for all the students or anybody else out there. So if you haven't got enough of Adese, she will be back <laughs> um, uh, in May and she'll give a more in-depth presentation of her work, as well as um, Mr. Um, uh, R. Stevens Lewis and Katie Sprague. And what's interesting about um, the first two panelists, um, they are actually kind of reside 
they came from different uh, uh, backgrounds. And um, it, with the example of Katie, she has a, uh, a, a degree in graphic design from the Art Center, uh, but she worked um, for a long period of time, 30 years uh, for RTKL, focusing on environmental design. Uh, Mr. Lewis um, is, uh, went, uh, uh, gravitated more towards urban design. And then, of course, Adese will talk about her work at HOK and prior. Um, so um, we'll make sure that um, this gets out to the different groups so that you can keep in touch with these. Um, you can stay plugged in for uh, future speaker opportunities. And that's all I have. Thank you. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to quote the quote that uh, went out earlier. Kim, you made this quote, and it's that, uh, design excellence is a right. So if that doesn't help compel all of our students that are attending tonight to move forward to achieve the same level of expertise that you have shown us is possible tonight, I really don't know what can. So thank you very much for um, everything that you've given us, all of your experiences that you've shared. And please know that your mentoring of our students um, is incredibly meaningful for all of us. So thank you so much. And um, we'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everyone. You. Thank you. Thank Wonderful you. to participate. Take care. Uh, yes, the, thanks, Kim, Adesa, Dawn. Yes, everybody in the uh, panel, um, wonderful, and all of our attendees. Thanks. Great, guys.